Good morning, Marianas, and welcome to this new day. I'm Troy Torres. And I'm Danielle Baza. It is 6.19 a.m. on Tuesday, the 13th of September, 2022. And when we come back, we'll bring you our top stories, uh, which includes dengue fever, monkeypox, swamp road, and the ongoing controversy involving Peter Santos, a writing candidate for attorney general and the gubernatorial campaign. Stick with us. that this environment is for anybody that wants to try something new. Um, whether it is CrossFit or powerlifting, we offer a safe space for someone who's never been athletically inclined to try something that they've never done before. When is that craft beer thing? Is that in October or is that happening now? The 76 craft beer. I want craft beer. You want to win $500? <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for this morning, for this morning, we got our coffees. Uh, but Temi also got us, went over to Circle K, my boyfriend, went over to Circle K and got us what has become my favorite snack now. And I call it a snack when it's really a meal. <laughs> it's a spicy spam masubi red with red rice. rice. I like practically finished mine. I'm supposed to give this to you, but if you don't want to eat it because if you're a keto, no, it's Cheeto not diet. that. Yeah, I've been Cheetoing. Oh, uh, it's just that the blood test, and then I'll try this out. Oh, it's super good. Yeah. It's super good. But warm it up, though. Warm but it up. But take half, because I won't eat all that. Uh, I'll just eat the entire thing. Anyway, <laughs> on to our headlines for today. I noticed the shoe file was gone yesterday. <laughs> Both gubernatorial campaigns say they respect the nonpartisan nature of the race for Attorney General of Guam, but only one team is denying it attempted to manipulate the race for AG by speaking with write-in candidate Peter Santos. 
Mr. Santos sent messages Saturday to AG candidate Doug Moylan following Santos's announcement as a write-in ca- campaign candidate for the job against Moylan and incumbent Levin Camacho. In the messages, Mr. Santos claims, quote, Representatives from both gubernatorial camps contacted me and asked me to lay off of Levin. They don't want you to win, he says to Doug Moylan, and they are going to do everything in their power to make sure Levin wins. I felt like I had to jump in in order to try and take the guaranteed win from Levin, end quote. Candid yesterday asked the managers of both campaigns whether they had communicated with Mr. Santos about the matter. The Republican team of Camacho Ada responded directly, stating, quote, The Camacho Ada 2022 campaign, including the candidates and its chairman, has never spoken with Peter Santos about doing everything in our power to ensure Levin Camacho wins. The election of the Attorney General of Guam is a nonpartisan election. Our campaign will not endorse any candidate in a nonpartisan race to include the Attorney General and members and commissioners of the Guam Education Board and the Consolidated Commission on Utilities, respectively." End quote. The campaign manager for the Democratic team of Leon Garo Tenorio, Rory Respicio, did not respond to the question directly, instead writing, quote, The AG's race is a nonpartisan race, and as such, the campaign won't be endorsing any candidate. End quote. Candid did follow up, asking Mr. Respicio to kindly respond directly to the question of whether any senior campaign officials or the candidates themselves attempted to manipulate the AG race. He read, but did not respond to the follow-up question. Mr. Santos, meanwhile, maintains he did speak with campaign officials, though he was not sure how senior these officials are, and he would not break the confidentiality agreement he had with these yet-to-be-named officials. He wrote to Candid, quote, When I was approached, I was asked to keep their identity confidential as a condition of having the conversation, end quote. In related news, Mr. Santos is challenging an assertion Dr. Ron McNinch has made to the Guam Election Commission. On Saturday, Dr. McNinch wrote to election commissioners opining that no writing candidates should be allowed on the general election ballot for attorney general because Guam law is clear that one qualification to be on the ballot is to place first or second in the race in the primary election. Dr. McNinch also said the legislature's intent on an AG candidate receiving a clear majority in the general election also is clear. Mr. Santos today responded to Dr. McNinch, stating in part, quote, McNinch is plain wrong about whether or not a writing candidate for AG is permitted in the general election. He has stated that it is opinion that the general the legislature did not intend to allow a write-in candidate, but that is just his interpretation. Under canons of statutory construction, the plain meaning of the statute is the strongest argument. We are not to infer meaning. If the legislature wanted to disallow a write-in for AG in the general election, it could have, would have, and should have said so. In our judicial system, it is not best practice to rely solely on the legislative history because the record, although may may shed some light on the issue, is not comprehensive and the present issue inevitably contains factors that were not considered back at that time and other laws that affect the consideration as a whole may have been enacted, modified, or repealed. The danger is exactly what McNinch is doing. He is imposing his own particular interpretation. He is asserting things that must be inferred and is not in the plain language of the statute." The first case of monkeypox is on Guam, imported by an incoming traveler, according to a joint news release from the governor's office and the Department of Public Health. Confirmation of the individual's illness was made by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on September 11. The individual, whose name will not be released to preserve their privacy, arrived on Guam on September 10. The traveler is cooperative and remains in isolation. The individual indicated they do not need medical attention and is being monitored for any changes in their condition. Public health staff will confer with the individual's health care provider to confirm the onset, onset date of symptoms to calculate the appropriate isolation period. Once the onset date of symptoms is confirmed, public health staff will calculate the isolation period and inform the individual of the end date of isolation to protect the public from the risk of infection. Public health has further launched a case investigation to identify and notify any possible close contacts. 
According to the CDC, monkeypox is a rare disease caused by infection with the monkeypox virus. Monkeypox symptoms are similar to smallpox, but milder, and monkeypox is rarely fatal. Monkeypox is not related to chickenpox. People with monkeypox get a rash that may be located on or near the genitals or anus and could be on other areas like the hands, feet, chest, face, or mouth. Other symptoms, according to public health, include fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes, exhaustion, muscle aches and backache, headache, and respiratory symptoms. Currently, testing is only recommended if you have a rash consistent with monkeypox. On the same day public health announced the presence of monkeypox on Guam, the agency con announced the confer confirmation of a case of dengue fever. The territorial epidemiologist reports that it is most likely an imported case. Nonetheless, this new case demonstrates how important it is for the people of Guam to maintain efforts, efforts to reduce mosquitoes and avoid mosquito bites, public health stated in a release. As a reminder, the dengue virus is transmitted to humans by the bite of an infected mosquito and cannot spread directly from person to person. Anyone who lives in or travels to an area where the dengue virus is found can get infected from mosquito bites. The community is advised to avoid mosquito bites and eliminate mosquito breeding sites to help stop the spread of the dengue virus. See your doctor if you have fever, aches and pains, rash and mild bleeding, usually around the nose or gums, according to the public health advisory. A person with a severe form of dengue fever called dengue hem hemorrhagic fever will have the following symptoms and needs to visit the nearest hospital emergency room immediately. Severe abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, significant bleeding, and lethargy or restlessness. To diagnose dengue, a healthcare provider may order blood tests. A blood test is the only way to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, can we just go to the wide shot real quick? I just want to comment. Blah, blah, blah. I want to comment on monkeypox. Now, I, I, I took coronavirus, you know, seriously enough to just listen to my doctor and, and get my, uh, what do you call it, uh, shot thing to, you know, at least if I got sick from it to not get too sick from it, right? I actually never tested positive for coronavirus during this entire period. But, it, you know, know, it didn't really scare me that much. And the dengue fever is like, okay, you know, you can die from it. It's scary a little. But the monkeypox. You, you can't listen, even die from the monkeypox. I don't care. You're going to get I ugly? I don't want to get <laughs> ugly from the monkeypox. Listen, at the gym last night, I have never sanitized areas so much before. <laughs> When I got the news that monkeypox was on Guam, I was like, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> That was your weapon of choice? Yeah. I was like, shh, 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 shh. I am not getting monkeypox from you dirty people. <laughs> anyway, in other news, in other news, Swamp Road finally will be paved. The project, according to the governor's office and the Guam Department of Public Works, begins today with intermittent lane closures anticipated. Area residents and motorists are advised to drive cautiously through the construction zones, observe posted speed limit and construction signs, and carefully heed flaggers when present. Alternate routes and or adjusted drive times are encouraged if and when feasible. Local funds are being used for this project. According to Governor Spokeswoman Crystal Paco San Augustine, taxes collected from the sale of liquid fuel and deposited into the Village Streets funds are being used for this. The funniest... Um, <laughs> that is going to mess up operations. It's going to... No, but you know what it's going to mess up? And it was a comment. Say. It was a comment from, from one of our viewers. It's going to mess up people trying to uh, get away from the cops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Business yeah. interruption on Swamp Road. You cannot get away from the cops anymore. Once that once that road is paved and there's blacktop and the cops are able to go just as fast as you on that road, you're no you're no longer able to maneuver because you know where all the puddles are. Yeah. <laughs> Alternate routes, people. When we come back, when, next. when we come back, uh, we're going to ask you for some help again uh, for. Uh, our niece, Araya, we're also going to bring you pictures of a very nice thing that a young gentleman named Alan Kakis did. And then uh, we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit about the Nicholas Moore trial when we come back from this commercial break. Please stick with us.
Welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us. Now, the first thing we have to ask you is, uh, well, let me just retell this story. Uh, a couple of months ago, our niece, Araya, it's actually Eric Rosario, our uh, chief of production, uh, his sister's daughter, the middle child, she's 12 years old, uh, she started uh, feeling unwell. Uh, and uh, it was uh, bad enough that they started going to the doctors and the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with her. Uh, and then it, it got so bad, she started to faint. Uh, she started to get these dizzy spells. And then uh, they finally uh, saw that one of her symptoms was these seizures and the seizures started to get worse. Doctors still don't know what's wrong with her. And so she's been referred off island for specialty treatment. The family now is uh, getting all of their stuff together, their passports, uh, all the stuff for Medicaid. And so her medical expenses uh, will be paid for. Uh, thankfully because of Medicaid but unfortunately you know that doesn't cover things like travel expenses for both Eric and the mother and uh, I'm not sure if Araya is covered as a patient I think she might be covered as a patient but anyway they're raising money so that they can be able to afford to get this medical treatment for Araya and so if you go to GoFund there's, there's Eric and there's Araya if you go to GoFundMe and you do a simple search for Araya May that's one word a-R-I-A-H-M-A-E. It'll be the first uh, thing that comes up on the top left-hand corner. Danielle confirmed that this morning. Uh, and if you can, if you have the ability you know, to donate anything, any amount that you can, it will really help this family. And so on behalf of our Candid family, thank you so much for your time and for your consideration in helping our family out. Uh, there was a bit of good news yesterday, at least one glimmer of hope in the sea of bad news uh, that was yesterday. Everything from just a horrible magistrate's report of uh, accusations uh, of uh, rape of two young children. Who's the one guy that wasn't in the magistrate's? Oh, one guy that was in the magistrate's reports yesterday. One guy who was not uh, accused of uh, trying to manipulate the AG race. Uh, and uh, no monkeypox or dengue fever here. <laughs> is a young man named Alan Kakis. Who, and, and thanks to a candid viewer, uh, we were provided these images and this story. This guy didn't seek any... He wasn't looking for any fanfare. He just went to Oka Point over the weekend. I know, I know. Johnny's laughing really hard about these pictures of what people actually drew on this platform at Oka Point. Good job, Guam. Good job <laughs> with, with your Pesky artwork. Kids. <laughs> so, so thankfully, you know, Alan Kaka saw this and he was like, you know, that's not pleasant art. Uh, and so he cleaned this area up. He did it by himself uh, and he did it without expecting any sort of recognition. Uh, and these are the best kind of people to recognize yes. uh, for doing a good job. And some people were like, were like, oh, it's just going to be painted over uh -huh. again. That's not the point. Yeah. The point is that there are good people like Alan Kakis who yeah. will do things like this because he loves Guam. And so kudos to Alan Kakis. Did you read um, my story that you actually contributed to, the Nicholas Moore trial story? <laughs> no, I didn't get to it yet. You haven't read the story? I, what kind the, of candid news are you? The, the, the notification popped up, and then I was cooking. I actually cooked last night. What did you cook? We made baked potatoes and then, oh, well, Ground Claire did the steak. <laughs> so but good. hey, I helped a lot. <laughs> That's like when Temi tells people that he cooked the things that I cooked because he washed the dishes. <laughs> that is con that's contribution, not, That's not bro. right. <laughs> it's not correct. And I got this you, out As a matter of fact, you're going to have to go to confession for that. <laughs> and you better make sure you tell people that Grandma Claire actually cooked all that food. Bro. Okay, so check this out. <laughs> After you made the pot roast, right? For um, poor Nicholas Moore is not getting his day <laughs> on un candid. Okay. So after I made the pot roast, yeah, what? for uh, for Laylee's christening. Yeah. I was like, oh, remember we got? I when I said I'm. Gonna I'll get smash pot your face too. and you say that that <laughs> you cooked that pot roast. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so you tried to make the pot roast. Johnny was on the phone with me, video call like two hours. Like, and was it good? On and on. <laughs> Bro. It was, <laughs> Damn, Johnny. She didn't have the microphone. Yeah. So for two hours, she just kept calling me like, let me see it, let me see it. And then, you know, it was all good, boiling right and whatever. Last 20 minutes. You burned it? <laughs> it almost, was... almost. I've done that. I've done that a couple of times. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't pay attention at the end. And you have to be careful because it looks like it's a lot of water when it's boiling. Yeah. But when it boils really, really fast, that means... There's yeah. hardly any water left. 
and yeah. you actually have to turn off because the pot roast after in, in the 10 minutes after you turn off the heat will absorb all of the all oh, of the juices that's and that's why. how it gets that's how it gets nice juicy and tasty you have to wait for like 10 minutes after it turns off for it to absorb all of that trial and error I guess. Yeah, well, almost. Almost. <laughs> that is a very, very expensive try. Like, no. <laughs> Jesus Christ. There you go. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not like we didn't have to talk about the Nicholas Moore okay. trial. <laughs> Sorry. No, but that the, continues those... today at 1 p.m. Yeah. Whatever I transcribed, that was, that was interesting. Tell us about what you saw in the transcription. So, Danielle helped me with this story by. Uh, I took the notes and. I, I take copious notes when I'm in trial. Yeah, and those so are it's, really it's, good notes. It is, I believe, 99% to 100% an accurate transcription of what was said between David Luhan, the defense attorney for Nicholas Moore, and the person he was cross-examining in the Nicholas Moore trial, Eric Salone. And Eric Salone, just to give you some background here, on the evening of October 15, 2020, both Nicholas Moore and a man named Eric Salone, he's uh, in the Navy, uh, were in a truck, and from that truck, either one or two gunshots were fired. A 38 uh, and a 45, right? Allegedly. allegedly. Definitely a 38. Okay. Because it was, we don't know if a 45 was actually fired. It's what Eric Salone tells the jury uh, and has told the Attorney General's office in exchange uh, for his freedom. He was an original co defendant in the case. He is the only person. Who has, who in this case, who has admitted to shooting from that truck, uh, and the reason that gunshot is important is because uh, from that gunshot that came out of the truck, a fragment entered the leg of Brian Mendiola the evening of October 15, 2020, in Agani Heights, down the road from Governor Carl Gutierrez's house. If, if it, it's it's that road, the road that goes inward, it's the one where there's a lot of there's a lot of drugs and stuff yeah. in that area. Okay. We, we know there you know, from before. <laughs> and, um, and <laughs> let's just be real here. And, and so um, uh, Nicholas Moore is on trial for the shooting of Brian Mendiola in the leg. But the defense has maintained from the beginning that the attorney general charged the wrong man in this case. And that the forensic evidence and the witness testimony will show that uh, it was actually uh, Eric Salone who likely was the shooter in this case. And so Eric Salone has been on the stand and he's been undergoing cross-examination. So why don't you tell our viewers what you saw uh, in that transcription? So it really sounded like he just tore him apart, right? Like he... Um, You're talking about uh, Luhan. Luhan yeah, tore apart, tore apart Salone. Salone. Yeah, he tore apart Salone. Yeah, he's a druggy he he everything that he said was cha like he changed it up like do you trust this guy would you say that this is your friend and then all of a sudden it was well then why did your friend tell say that you're, you're the, the one, one that shot him you're like, the one with a 38 yeah. caliber and i'm gun. wondering where's yeah. that guy did did he get How, you're talking about javier mercado the yes. friend he testified and he testified uh that um uh what did he testify that it was Salone, right? No, he didn't say it was Salone. He just said that this was the gun. I can't remember correctly. That was so many days ago. Eric Salone has been the one that's been on trial, or on, I'm sorry, on the stand mm -hmm. for several days now in mm -hmm. trial. And I just, now I can't remember exactly what Mercado said, and I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, but what Mercado told investigators, this was not on the, on the stand, but what he told investigators was that Eric Salone told him and was bragging mm -hmm. that he was the one who used the 38 caliber gun that night. Yes. Yeah. Oh. And so the reason that that's important is because it was a 38 caliber fragment that was pulled from the leg of Brian Mendiola. And the fact that it was a fragment actually is a point that's going to come up in trial. Uh, it was an entire bullet that was pulled out from Brian Mendiola's leg, but just a fragment. And so the going theory in forensic evidence is that it ricocheted. And the reason that's important as a note is because Eric Salone's testimony is that Nicholas Moore shot directly out and toward the crowd of four people, according to Eric Salone, and that Eric Salone shot toward the ground, which would yeah. cause a ricochet. And so all of this stuff is coming up. There's just so much doubt already growing around this allegation that Nicholas Moore was the shooter in this in this case. Now, I have to be clear. This is not the Michael Castro murder case for which Nicholas Moore also uh, will stand trial for that murder. Yeah. 
But there is a related piece of evidence in this case. Now, you have to understand this incident occurred about 14 or 15 days prior to the murder of Michael Castro. It's been a hot season. And according to the prosecution in this case, one of the weapons that was allegedly used in this case, a 45 caliber gun, actually was retrieved by police investigators and is believed to be the murder weapon in the Michael Castro case. And one of the things that came up outside the presence of the jury was that there was a third set of prints found on this 45 caliber gun. It was among the reasons that Eric Salone was interviewed on June 7, 2021. Uh, and actually, it was the main reason he was interviewed on June 7, 2021, because prior to that, there were three sets of prints. They were able to confirm that one set of prints was Nicholas Moore's. Another set of prints was Troy Ryan Damian's. But they couldn't figure out who the third set of prints were mm. until they found Eric Salone and found the match. So, but Eric Salone does not face charges in the Michael Castro murder case. Uh, this is all just such interesting uh, stuff to follow in court, uh, and we're going to continue following it today when the trial is scheduled to resume in the courtroom of Judge Alberto Tolentino at 1 p.m. You can get these stories and more on CandidNews.com. Uh, now we ask that you join us in turning our attention to the only show of any consequence or significance every weekday morning from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. That's the Ray Gibson Show on the radio dial at 93.3 FM. Uh, join us by listening on Facebook Live to The Point Guam for the Ray Gibson Show. Or you can listen on and watch on YouTube Live on the Ray Gibson Show. For Candid News, I'm Troy Torres. And I'm Danielle Baza. Please be safe on the road today on this rainy day on Guam. Good morning, Marianas. The Jones Act is a 1920 law justified on national security grounds as a means to bolster the U.S. maritime industry. It restricts domestic shipping to vessels that are U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, and U.S. crewed. However, this law boosts cost by banning foreigners from competing and forcing Americans to purchase ships that are up to eight times more expensive than those built in other countries. The result is higher transportation costs. Shipping oil from Texas to the Northeast, for example, costs three times more than importing oil from Africa. Ultimately, consumers foot the bill. In addition, higher shipping costs push freight from ships onto other sources of transportation, such as trucks, which means more traffic and pollution. Meanwhile, this blatant protectionism has failed to benefit builders of ships in the U.S., whose production is less than 1% of those in China and South Korea. Domestic builders have seen over 300 shipyards close since the early 1980s. Jones Act defenders claim the law ensures adequate U.S. ships during times of war, but during U.S. deployments during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, foreign flagged commercial ships carried twice as much equipment as their U.S. counterparts. In fact, the U.S. was so desperate for shipping that it twice requested the use of a cargo ship from Moscow. Both requests were denied. So the Jones Act has failed to achieve its shipbuilding and national security goals while driving up costs for consumers. It's time for this outdated, costly, and ineffective law to be repealed. It's time to end the Jones Act.